Yeah, well, welcome everyone to the final episode of the Business Exchange, How Business Works, um, brought to you by the American Business Council. Um, it, it, it's um, some kind of uh, feeling of, oh, the year is ending, the Christmas bells are ringing, and, you know, COVID is, there was, there was the impression that, oh, we're going to run away from these, and, you know, 2021, end of 2021, COVID would be a thing of the past, um, but, um, you know, the COVID bells are also chiming. And so um, before we go on, uh, I'll just uh, say that uh, the business exchange, for those who haven't heard us, is a bi-weekly program that talks, you know, or looks into issues around um, business and the industry, the deep dive into that. And we bring in experts to share their perspectives. And at the end of the day, uh, in some cases, especially in this particular case, we're going to share um, some level of prediction of what we see uh, moving forward. My name is Margaret Olili, and I'm your host, as, as always. I have with me here um, two very interesting persons, and, and I'm going to start off with Jude Moore. I know I, know I got it right, Jude Moore. Uh, Jude, Jude Moore is, is actually a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development and a one-time minister uh, from uh, Liberia. Um, of Liberia, not from Liberia, because, you know, obviously that would be um, talking about who he is, you know, in terms of country will be another conversation. And also we have uh, with me uh, Nonso Obikili. So Nonso is uh, the Development Coordination Officer, uh, Economist, uh, UN Resident um, Coordinator's Office. And um, Yes, Amaka was meant to join us, um, but uh, well, if she if she jumps in before the end of this uh, uh, conversation, then that will just be very very great. And so yes, um, twenty twenty one, great things happened in twenty twenty one. Would I say great things in the reverse? But you know, let's not be pessimistic. Uh, but but a couple of things that uh, still remain on our radar, especially when we talk about Nigeria, um, is is for instance the issue around. Um, the subsidy issue around COVID uh, nineteen variants, you know the all the um, acrobatics, you know that were um, involved in it, and not just Nigeria, but obviously across the continent. And then, of course, we have the um, the COP twenty six and the conversation that I'm sure Judy would like to share. I saw a couple of your articles on, um, you know, climate um, after the reaction to. Um, COVID uh, by the West, you know, nobody's going to help Africa uh, in the area of a climate change conversation and all conversations and all. But again, um, I would say, so I don't talk too much. Welcome, Nansu, and welcome, Judy. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, th th thanks a lot. Um, so I I'll go right into um, what I consider a lingering ghost that we kind of continue to um, maybe haunt, in a sense, um, you know, the, 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 the Nigerian um, society or Nigeria as a country, and that is the issue of fuel subsidy. Um, that's a big cup you have. <laughs> Anyways, don't mind me. So, um, yeah, so we, we've had all this, um, long story of you know removal of oil subsidy, uh, Nigeria, and that's not news. Had spent over um, eighty two point one billion dollars, um, you know, on fuel subsidy in the in the last nine months, and uh, uh, we know that we already have that in the Petroleum Act. That yes, this is going to be implemented, and uh, government is looking at providing five thousand naira to. Um, to uh, the vulnerable um, uh, Nigerians uh, at all, at all. Uh, but um, there's so much that has happened in the past regarding fuel subsidy that um, there, there's still some level of, uh, is this going to happen and what will be the implication? So uh, do you honestly think that um, this is, and now I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot, um, so do you think that this is implementable? Because um, I mean, we we believe that by the first second and a half of next year we're going to have this done. Um, uh, do you? Uh, um, what are your thoughts, Nonso? Really, first of all, to you, Nonso. 
Okay, thank you, Margaret. Um, and just to set a bit of context. So there's a global push around the world to end energy subsidies, especially fossil fuel subsidies, uh, because they're kind of detrimental to the effort to move towards cleaner energy, and they are not really the best use of resources. So in that context, Nigeria is not alone uh, in terms of the efforts to try to end fossil subsidies. But the Nigerian case is kind of unique uh, because Nigeria's general government revenues are very, very low. Um, so I think there was a report by the World Bank earlier this year, of all the about 100 countries measured, Nigeria had the lowest general government revenue to GDP uh, of all the countries measured. Now, if you take into that context, the reality that Nigeria is spending somewhere around $2 billion a year on energy subsidies, subsidies that really only flow to the higher income segment of the population, then there is also a Nigeria-specific case uh, for ending subsidies, ending for subsidies. But the challenge is that subsidies, even though they flow to the wealthiest of the population, also affect the rest of the population. The challenge is how do you transition from a subsidy regime uh, to something else uh, in a way that does not really, in a way that ameliorates the pain that would happen for the rest of the population. Um, the government has some proposals. Um, I think they haven't, it's still not very, very clear exactly how it will go. Uh, they've mentioned that it will be ended in the first half of the year, and I certainly hope that's the case. Uh, but of course, you know, this is not the first time Nigeria is trying to end for subsidies. Uh, and we know that as we, Nigeria goes into the elections in 2022, the political question will be a bit difficult. But I think the urgency of the revenue situation means that Nigeria needs to really take a look at how to transition away from these energy subsidies into something that is much more uh, productive for the population. Thank you so much, Nonso. And, and I'm really moving away from, because I do this all the time, moving a bit away from the script. Um, you talked about the issue around um, revenues uh, coming into, uh, into, into, into the government coffers as being one of the lowest in the world. And I know that before we, we said um, this conversation, there was there was the beat around um, you know some hemorrhaging on on par in some neighboring countries, and so I, I begin to wonder. And uh, I don't know if you want to take that piece, and then I would uh, you know um, really bring Jude into the conversation. Is it something that you you feel that government is not looking at as as opportunities to um, improve revenues in, in, in areas that you know um, they're able to block some of these leakages. I mean, we know that there are a couple of internal leakages, but when you have leakages, um, you know, that are clearly not within the country, then it becomes a bit of a concern. Uh, what What do you think about that, Nonso? Well, I mean, I know there's there's been a, a decent amount of effort put into generating revenues and plugging leakages over the last decade or so. Uh, and subsidies alone are not the only uh, way to generate revenues, of course, uh, but there's lots of other ways to generate revenues. I think the government is currently developing a financing framework that should even help um, push the agenda forward further. Uh, and yes, you know, thinking about the relationship with the uh, neighboring countries with regards to power, you know, you need to figure out how to plug leakages there. I'm not sure, but I think there are contracts around the um, water resources use, especially under River Niger. That means that Nigeria has to supply parts to some neighboring countries as a condition for them not uh, damming the river. I'm not 100% sure about that. But yeah, plugging those leakages would be good. Uh, but the big overriding issue, the big obvious leakage is the first subsidy. And, you know, you can, you can do two things at the same time, right? You can try to plug other leakages, but you can also try to deal with some of the uh, less efficient spending at home. Uh, so it's not a case of you can only do one or the other. You can do both things. Uh, the energy subsidies is perhaps an easier one and one in which the direct effects would be felt almost immediately. And that's why there's the push uh, on that front. Jude. Just, you know, I, I think from my perspective from the distance here is that in a lot of African countries, you saw that when, when during the COVID crisis, um, developed countries spent trillions of dollars supporting their citizens, supporting businesses. And in, in many African countries, Nigeria included, they, the Average citizen and local companies do not get that kind of support in the face of shocks. So in, in instances where the government provides very little in terms of benefits to its people, 
then things like subsidies actually are one of the few ways that a government actually is able to reach and touch people's lives. And so over time, even when the subsidies become inefficient and ineffective, there is a constituency around the subsidy. I think this is why the federal government is actually thinking about things like giving the 5,000 Naira uh, to people so that as you take away that direct benefit that people got, you're able to replace it with something because governments are supposed to be able to touch their people's lives in that way. I think on um, in terms of, look, uh, it's Ricardo Hausman at uh, Harvard. He, in one of his podcasts said that countries become, countries remain wealthy, not because of what they have, but because of what they know. Nigerians around the world, and even in Nigeria, are some of the most enterprising, entrepreneurial, and hardworking people. And as long as the government continues to invest in Nigerians, the growth of the Nigerian economy is going to come from the Nigerian people because that is the largest asset that the state has. So, yeah, cut waste. But if all of the cutting of the waste is then directed as investing in human capital, investing in education, investing in health, investing in the Nigerian people, I'm pretty confident that, that some of the problems that we're talking about now will be solved. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And and again, uh, you know, that goes into the whole thinking around the 5,000 Naira. And yeah, it, 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 it's, an, I mean, how it's such a short term, you know, way of, of, of approaching um, this, this, um, you know, situation of alleviating poverty and, and all. Um, what if this stakeholder, these people were meant to have some kind of a long term stick? Well, that's just me thinking in my head, but I, I'm wondering what 5,000 would do in the face of uh, realities. And the realities are, um, you know, inflation. Yes, I know that we heaved some sigh of relief when, um, you know, the inflation came down to about 15 or so percent about, and um, people were like, oh, yeah, this is great. Um, in spite of that, we were seeing, um, you know, aspiring uh, prices of items in Lagos, which obviously, you know, you have the bulk of the, 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 the population. And, and and so, again, you know, puts into question the issue of, of the inflation um, um, reports and, and all. But, I mean, people have different sides to the elephant, as they say, um, or see different sides of the elephant. But the, the challenge or the reality is as we move into 2022, you know, with um, the COVID-19 um, variant and, you know, the upsurge and with the challenges that we have around the global supply chain, um, how do you how do you see, um, you know, what inflation may look like? I mean, I know that um, you may not necessarily have the crystal ball right in, in your face, but how do you what do you what do you think 20, 2022 would hold for Nigeria today? This is the difficulty, yeah. I think uh, one of the reasons why I've always I've, I've enjoyed uh, 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 talking to Manso, uh, me from a distance, and him there in in Nigeria is that you know he tries as much as is possible to be objective and reflect the local realities. But stepping back for a minute, so he can speak to 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 that. Well, what I want to talk about is the world is so interconnected now that this supply chain crisis has really, really affected Africa. The cost of, a, of an empty container leaving a US port and going back to China now is sometimes higher than the cost of shipping a container to Africa. And so because of that, uh, transport and logistics companies are basically abandoning sending containers to Africa and focusing on European and American markets. That is coming at a cost. In 2020, over 70% of African imports from the EU 27 were finished goods. We are more dependent on imports, even for food stuff, than most other regions. And so this supply chain crisis is actually driving uh, uh, inflation as we're seeing. And there was this story out of Nigeria where it's not simply the supply chain crisis. It is also when your goods actually get into the country, getting your goods out of the port and getting your goods to the final destination. There are inefficiencies within the system to such an extent that that cost is then passed on to the average person who's buying the, the final uh, um, uh, purchaser of, of the good or the service. And so I think, you know, the, the World Bank thinks and the IMF in their projections based on 
this availability of vaccines, we're supposed to see some growth across the the uh, the African and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. But the largest economies, Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, the, uh, I think Kenya, were not projected to see significant growth. So I don't know. It's really, I mean, it's Christmas time. You're supposed to give people hope, but um, it doesn't seem like 2022 is going to be better for us in Africa, including for 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 people in Nigeria. And so. Uh, maybe Nanso has something more hopeful to say. Nanso, maybe you'd bail us out of uh, where where we're headed at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, to sound a bit more hopeful, uh, to, I mean, the, the challenge with uh, the pandemic is that it means that most lots of things are largely unpredictable. Uh, before the Omicron variants, we thought most of the world was heading into some kind of sense of normalcy. And all that has upturned in a space of a few weeks. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and because of that, it's difficult to see how this goes. But I guess to be a bit more optimistic, we kind of saw that 2020 was the worst year, at least for Nigeria. Uh, you had rapid uh, hike in food prices, you had lockdowns, you had an unfortunate weather crisis. You have security crisis that have a lot of food crops. I know mean, because in the Nigerian context, food is very, very important for inflation. And so we also saw all those factors combine to result in food inflation that topped 20%. Uh, and this is important in the context where the average Nigerian pre-COVID spent about 60% of their income on food. So it's very, very important. But 2021 has turned out not as bad as 2020. Uh, it's not been great. We are still ending the year with inflation around 15% or so, which is still high. Uh, but in that context, it's not as bad as 2020. And so the hope is that as the world hopefully moves back to normal, uh, as the Nigerian macroeconomic environment stabilizes, uh, hopefully with another good farming year, uh, food inflation in Nigeria, inflation in general, should at least continue to trend relatively downwards. Uh, but again, it's largely unpredictable. Uh, there are key issues in the Nigeria specific case that continue to affect food inflation, security challenges, which has displaced lots of farmers, security challenges in the Northeast, uh, the continued dependence on rain fed agriculture in an environment where there's uh, ever increasing shock from climate change. Uh, all those will continue to kind of influence the Nigerian productive environment, which will feed into inflation. Uh, and of course, the policy environment, which is still very very uh, anti-food trade, to put it that way, uh, doesn't actually help. Uh, I think Nigeria has a very a significant deficit in terms of food, uh, which when not filled with imports, leads to higher food prices. Uh, so there's a combination of factors which can result in either a good year for Nigeria next year or a bad year. Um, some of those factors are beyond Nigeria's control, uh, but some are. Uh, and I think for Nigeria, the important thing we need to try to build resilience, uh, resilience to any kind of shocks so that if you have a bad weather year, you can still cope. If you have, if the pandemic worsens, you can still cope. Uh, if you have an escalation security crisis, you can still cope. Uh, and so I think that's really the, the key determining factor. How much resilience can Nigeria build uh, to withstand any shocks? Uh, because because of the pandemic, it's still largely unpredictable. Uh, but I guess I would be a bit more hopeful than Gudi. Uh, I think 2021 was not as bad as 2020. And I don't think 2022 would be as bad as 2021. Yeah, so so uh, in a sense, I, I, I tend to want to lean towards you, Nonso. Please, I, I, I please know, lean no towards Nonso. So. <laughs> no, no hard feelings, <laughs> Jude. Um, Nigerians are very resilient people. In fact, I think for 2022, we're going to all have middle name Maggie Resilient Olele, you know, that kind of thing. And just, just to say how we are, you know, but while both of you were sharing your thoughts, two things kind of, you know, uh, popped up um, and, and, and one came from the conversation around the imports, food imports, um, the fact that, you know, most of our food in the continent, are, at least in Nigeria specifically, are imported. And then also the issue around policies um, where you, you know, um, where you find the anti-trade, you know, issues come, you know, also popping up. There, there is a struggle and a, you know, to balance the, the issue around, you know, food security and, you know, um, uh, protectionism and, and the of our existence. 
Um, what do you think about this? Norm? So how do you think government should go? I, I know that in, in, in recent, um, in the last couple of months, um, and even from the American Business Council perspective, we have had to engage different levels of government around um, Ishida um, restrictions and, 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 and all that for um, a couple of items, you know, being brought in uh, to into the country. And so, um, how do we start? Do we do we ensure that we 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 restrict these items, or or and then start working towards getting to where we need to be, or do we need, we need to have a fair balance? Well, I think first, you know, just to correct some you know misconception, you know, most of our food is not important. Uh, most of the food consumed by Nigerians is grown locally. But there is a significant gap between demand and supply, which typically is filled by imports. And that gap is the challenge. Uh, so Nigerians produce a lot of yams, a lot of cassava, rice. Sorry, can I, can I just stop you there? Sorry, non still and, and I'm not being rude. Um, so when you think of, I mean, of course, rice is now, you know, a good story. Uh, but when you think of items like um, wheat, for instance, uh, where you know we, you know um, we, we do make a uh, you know flour, bread, you know these basic things, and some other items like that, on the on the surface may not seem like these are direct consumptions, but they they do have significant impact on food. Um, I I would say that you know we do quite a bit of. Uh, um, reliance on, on 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 food but this is me but go ahead <laughs> I mean, the mbs published the consumption survey just before covid 2019 and the data is there right uh yams cassava plantains rice are still the most consumed food yep. uh, it doesn't mean that there are no that, that import imported food does not have an impact there's still a significant gap between demand and supply for many crops that is filled with imports and even if you have a 10% gap, that's enough to drive prices high. Uh, but again, it's just to, to be clear that it's not a case that Nigeria or even Africa as a whole imports the bulk of its food. It's just that you have significant demand supply gaps. And closing that gap is really the challenge. Uh, and you know, the way to do that, on the one hand, you know, we know poverty rates are high, people are struggling, people spend 60% of their incomes on food. So you really don't want prices to go high. But at the same time, most people are employed in agriculture. Agriculture is still the highest employ employment sector. And so you don't want them to be outcompeted by imported food. And so the key challenge there is, on the one hand, to improve the productivity of domestic agriculture. If you move the productivity of domestic agriculture, even for crops that we don't necessarily eat, then you have kind of a bargaining chip to take to global markets. And that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you kind of also want to have sustainable food trade. Uh, I like to say Lagos is one of the least food insecure places in Nigeria, but nobody produces any food in Lagos, right? It's because there's a lot of other activities that give people incomes that allow them to purchase the food that they want from Nigeria, from the rest of West Africa, from wherever. So the question about food security is really about balance. On the one hand, improving your agricultural productivity so that you have as much food as possible, you have some excess crops, food crops that you can take to global markets and exchange for the crops that you want. Uh, and on the other hand, ensuring that your farmers, your people in rural areas have diversified income bases that allow them uh, to not be as dependent on the, right, the, the vagaries of food prices. Uh, so I think for the Nigerian context, finding that balance is the key. I don't think we need to shut down food trade. I think we need to engage a more sustainable food trade. Uh, but at the same time, we really need to improve the productivity of agriculture. And there's some effort being done around wheat, for example. Wheat is one of the crops that, due to our environment, uh, we just don't produce enough of it. Uh, there's some new wheat programs that are trying to get new, new, new varieties of wheat that can hopefully grow in Nigeria, and that should help that. Uh, but in the meantime, you probably need to import wheat. Uh, wheat is a very important urban crop, urban food source, especially for bread, indomie, spaghetti, things like that. And so if you don't, you know, allow, you know, weeds to, important weeds to close that demand gap, then you end up with higher food prices that causes all sorts of, all sorts of problems down the line. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you may not produce all your weeds, but you can definitely improve the productivity of this. You can definitely improve the productivity of, of sesame seeds, of ginger, of other crops that have international demand that you can then use 
to kind of counteract your food trade. So if you think of Nigeria as having a food balance sheet, it's not just about closing the demand gap, right? You also want to expand the supply gap. That's the way to close the balance sheet. And I think that's where Nigeria needs to go. Uh, so again, it's about balance. I don't think Nigeria doesn't import all the food that we eat. Uh, there are significant gaps, but a lot of food is produced in Nigeria. Uh, the challenge is we need to be more productive, produce more, and be competitive. And this is going to be very important as we go into the AFCFTA period, uh, where Absolutely. Nigeria will be forced to compete. Nigeria will be forced to compete with farmers from Liberia and from Ghana and from South Africa, and there will be no place to hide them. So improving agricultural productivity in Nigeria is really, really key. Uh, to to fixing that food inflation or closing that food gap. That's great, uh, Jude. Do you do you have do you want to share some thoughts on this, or we just move Absolutely. right Absolutely, I think I think yeah. also is is one hundred percent correct. One of the problems that we've had mm. hasn't been our inability, simply the inability to produce food. Is how even though more than fifty percent of the population of the continent is involved in agriculture, that agriculture is still largely unproductive. And the, the productivity we're talking about is, you know, <clears throat> is yields that our yields are smaller compared to places elsewhere is storage. When that yield does come up, where is it stored? I was in Burkina Faso for a project and I talking to a guy who wanted to invest in silos because he told me that at one point Burkina Faso produces so much uh, potatoes that they export the potatoes to uh, Canada. And then at some point in a year, they go through this phase where everybody is so hungry, they have to import potatoes from Canada again. The problem is simply because Burkina Faso doesn't have the means of storage, of being able to store that potato in the long term, so that climate control or storage facilities. So I think there are things that we can do in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Liberia, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, about our agriculture that can make it slightly more productive and, and be able to close that gap that Nelson spoke about. I think productivity is the target here. Yeah, but thank you so much, Jude. But let, let's move completely away from um, this, uh, the beat around, you know, food to, to something that, again, we said the conversation with, and it's still really very much around us, which is the COVID-19 um, conversation. So, um, South Africa did what the whole world thought was honorable, you know, by uh, letting letting us know about a variant in South Africa. But then it suddenly became, uh, I think we forgot very, very quickly that um, COVID-19 did not start from, from Nigeria, uh, but I, but then it, uh, it's, uh, sorry, from Africa, but also that uh, it, it said from way, you know, out of, of the continent and said, Red listing and black listing or whatever it is they would say um they they they, they did to, to 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 us you know and and so um when you with when you pit these against um you know the outset of covid nineteen when china you know to some level you know hit this until they became they couldn't hide it anymore uh you know we, you then begin to ask should should really I mean, I shouldn't ask this, but, you know, uh, but uh, behind the scene, a lot of people have been saying should, maybe South Africa may not should not have been trans that transparent. Sometimes in the in the world of global politics, especially when um, you're you're uh, you know you're on on the you're not you're you're really not on the on the on the offensive. You're not the one who is the dominant person. You really need to be uh, very um crafty as a fox as 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 they would say so um again the question is um should should we continue to be well i mean i don't know i don't know if i should ask this question in in, in, in public but i was still say, what do you think about i think you we know, know the question and, politics and transparency <laughs> and 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 diplomacy right so um judy so if you go back it, um, there is a there is an international database called Gilead, where scientists upload information about new variants, and and the, the Botswana scientists that first uh, drew attention to this, they uploaded it to that. But when you go back and listen to the interviews with the Botswana scientists, they said that the samples in which they found Omicron were from four diplomats who were basically on their way out 
of Botswana at the time, and they had come from Europe. They, it, it doesn't say that they're Europeans, but they had traveled to Europe. My fear is that if African countries discover new variants and somehow because of the way it happened with South Africa, do not put that information out there, people traveling from Africa and Africans traveling elsewhere, when their samples are found with new variants, the same thing will happen. So there is no real benefit. I think it, South Africa did the best thing that one should do in a situation like this. And that's part the unfortunate way that the global, the, especially the global North responded to the South African declaration. I think we can go back to where you discover a new variant and then you hide it because you're afraid that Saudi Arabia will close their border to you. I, I don't think there, there's, there are no benefits to that. In fact, the costs would be even higher. So yeah, it's unfortunate that that's happened to South Africa, but we have to remain transparent. Uh, at least that's what I think. Absolutely. Uh, not so what, what, what do we think, especially as we look at it from a point of view of, uh, you know, foreign relations and um, uh, diplomacy, right? Well, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I think, you know, it's a responsibility that you have uh, to contribute to knowledge about COVID, about disease, about variants. Uh, and we in Africa have to take up that responsibility if we have to. Um, I think, you know, countries are scared. And so there's the tendency for people to overreact once there's new information. Uh, but I think, you know, as Secretary General said, you know, we shouldn't be punishing countries for being proactive with information. Uh, and the COVID pandemic is a global pandemic. No country is going to be able to solve the pandemic on their own. It will require global cooperation. And Africa needs to be part of that global cooperation. I think South Africa must have done a good job by proving, by showing that they can contribute and they can contribute to uh, the disease surveillance. Uh, and that should be rewarded and not punished. And I think many countries are, as the Omicron variant has, has spread around the world, many countries are backtracking on the initial uh, travel restriction that they put in place. Um, but I think, you know, I agree with Gide. Uh, we should continue to be transparent. We should continue to contribute. Uh, that's the best way out of this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. No, so, uh, you know, the bit around the backtracking did not um, come without a bit of arm twisting. And that's why, you know, whenever it is you're having um, uh, conversations in terms of, uh, you know, politics and diplomacy, you should you should have something to be strong on uh, you know, around the table. Otherwise, you know, um, I mean, looking at Nigeria, for, for instance, and, you know, um, some of the countries that eventually, um, you know, backtracked and, 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 you know, it came with some level of, Again, uh, a bit of pushing the weight, uh, which for once I don't well, no, for, for, this is where I like. So I which I applauded, yeah. So um it, it came, you know, for us in a, in a very um in a very good way. Um so there are so many other things. Um I know that for most of our um our podcasts this year at least one or two of maybe two at least we talked about uh, you know relationships with other countries with the u with the with europe with the united states and you know with china and um i recall and i really wish abaka was on this call because um we had a very interesting conversation on the um you know our relationship with china and uh in some cases, she kind of disagreed at, um, that in, in terms of the debt, um, you know, um, in, in Africa, that the, the, the debt is actually coming from the West and not necessarily from China in terms of the size and the magnitude of and the burden, uh, so to speak. But, you know, we, what we have seen maybe, maybe um, the beat around the China debt uh, or the Chinese debt in the continent has been um, kind of romanticized or whatever it is. I know that in some cases I've seen um, some um, story about a certain country in, 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 in the continent where people now speak Chinese and all that and they're completely taking over. Um, but, but the reality is that infrastructural assets and some some of these things in some of the countries that maybe um, you know um, we may not want to mention uh, we've seen some you know takeover uh, of, of some of these assets and so the question is um, 
do we what what makes the Chinese that appealing to the, the to African leaders and um, how how are we able to how is is is, is um, how are we able to to ensure that we at least get the best out of the deal if we have to work with what some of us perceive as sometimes you know short term um, gains that we have from um, the Chinese loans that are in my in my thinking and I may be wrong not as sustainable as you know if you have uh, you know uh, debts that are um, maybe from the West. Uh, this is me thinking. So, uh, what what do you think about this today? I was muted. I, I think I will start here by saying that the IMF this year saw what was what is it, they they call the the largest ever increase in global debt since twenty since the, the Second World War. It was a 28% increase in debt. The global debt is now around $226 trillion. Of that $226 trillion in global debt, Africa's total debt is somewhere between 750 and 1 trillion, 750 billion and 1 trillion, our total debt. So of the 226 trillion in debt around the world, we probably, as a percentage of that debt, have the smallest, less than 1%. The problem, I think, it, is our ability to service the debt. So if you're not earning as much in revenue, then even if the debt is small, your ability to service the small debt becomes a problem. So first, I simply wanted to say that, you know, countries taking on debt is not unusual. That's why I called, I, I listed this number from the beginning. Almost every country in the world has significant public debt, some of them over 100% of GDP. The problem with us in Africa is, you know, we have the greatest infrastructure need of every region in the world. In fact, the World Bank said that over the last two decades, Africa is the only region in the world where road density, the amount of road available per, say, 1,000 people has actually declined. So our population has gone up significantly, but our infrastructure has not kept up with population growth. And so because of that, we need infrastructure. But the way other people finance infrastructure is actually through their savings. And we have the lowest amount of savings on the continent, meaning that to finance African infrastructure, because we do not have savings, we have to look externally for money. In the past, we have looked at the West, IMF, World Bank, African Development Bank, and bilateral lenders. Well, those people begin to pay attention to, can you service this debt? What is the public financial management like? And so for many African countries, they turn to the one partner who will provide debt on the basis of the sovereign guarantee. They didn't pay much attention to how your public financial management system went. They felt all of that was internal. They didn't insist that you have reforms and policy changes as a means of being able to get loans from them. And they were able to provide infrastructure at the better value for money than, say, their European counterparts, and that's been China. So it's really hard to say why are African countries taking debt from China when there are very few options available to African countries. And I should note, as Amaka said, that only about 20 to 23 percent of African debt is Chinese. The rest of it is from private lenders through Eurobond issues or through local debt but also from the, the multilateral development banks. So 80% of that debt is not China, right? Close to 80% of that debt is not China. The final thing I would say on that China question and the debt of China is that at least seven countries in Africa account for more than 80% of Chinese debt to the entire continent. So China's debt is not evenly distributed among Africa's 50 plus countries. I think this is important for us to understand when we talk about Chinese debt on the continent. So having said all of that, it is definitely an issue because our economies are so fragile and, and have very, very little resilience in the face of shocks, external or internal, like this health crisis or say a drought or say weather, something with, with floods. Those small shocks tend to make it difficult for us to continue to, to, to service the debt. And so that's why the, the debt issue, regardless of how good the infrastructure is, the debt issue is always going to be there. So I don't want to join the people who say, you know, Chinese debt 
is is the is what's driving the problem in Africa. That that's not true. And you know, more than fifty six percent of Chinese lending to the continent has gone to infrastructure. If you remove Angola, it goes over seventy percent of Chinese lending has gone to infrastructure in Africa, and that is a huge need. Now, is that infrastructure always in the best place? Is that infrastructure always in the place that it should be? Well, you know, that that's another question. But definitely, I, I think China's presence on the continent, especially when it comes to infrastructure financing, has been a benefit to us. So, so uh, now I'm going to ask another question right over this one. Um, again, then how do you how do you then um, think the U.S. should play in in being able to support infrastructure in the continent? Um, you know, uh, because we always say that U.S. Um, has been a long term partner in the continent um, before the Chinese came, uh, but obviously um, there's something that's going wrong that needs to be. Um, you know, put right in terms of, you know, um, support um, for infrastructure. Yes, I know that, you know, they, they, there's always that bit about wanting to make them accountable, um, you know, for whatever debts they take, that's the African leaders. Well, how, is there something that we're missing out? Um, is there something that U.S. should consider um, in advancing, um, you know, support? No, I don't like using that word support, you know. Um, to in advancing some kind of um, collaboration, um, or at least to help, as a software word, to help drive uh, infrastructural growth in in the continent. So sure, I'll I'll be brief so that no so can come into. First, I want to say that it's very big, but it's not full. I'm just sipping. It, so just just to qualify, <laughs> it's a big okay. cup, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, there, there are a number of structural issues here. First, the U.S. no longer does government to government lending. It doesn't do bilateral lending. Nigeria couldn't come to the U.S. to borrow money as Nigeria would go to, to, to um, say, China. So this is one of, the, one of the difficulties of the U.S. The U.S. still doesn't. So for countries and, and, and the U.S. Development Finance Corporation is not going to be lending directly to governments. It's going to be lending mainly through the private sector, right, through non-governmental actors. And, and so this is the problem. China lends directly government to government, and the U.S. doesn't do that. The second thing is there are only two U.S. companies in the top 20 construction firms in the world. Heavy infrastructure, hard infrastructure, roads, ports, rail, that's not something that the U.S. does, at least not as efficiently and effectively as, say, the Chinese or the Turkish. So. The things the U.S. Uh, do really, really well are things like health, building health systems, like education. So human capital development is something the U.S. does really well. So in my view, I, I don't think there is, I think there's space and room in Africa because, you know, I, I, I was reading somewhere that of the million students graduating high school or needing to go to, to, to college, there's only space for about 500,000 or less in Nigeria. So there's a significant number of young people who graduate high school but may not get placed at a university, whether private or public, simply because the space is not available. This is an area in which the U.S. has expertise and competence. So I think what the U.S. can do is, you know, focus on the things in which the U.S. has significant strength, and that is human capital development. Half of the 2 billion people that will be added to global population between now and mid-century will be in Africa. Those people need to be trained. Those people need to be trained for a 21st century economy. And I think this is one of the places where the U.S. can. So instead of fighting the Chinese on building roads or fighting the Chinese on building ports, I think the U.S. should do the things that it does really well. But I still think there is a role of paying attention to public financial management because the debt issue could get out of hand. So I, I, there, there's room on the continent for both Chinese competences and U.S. competences. But I want to hear what Nunso has to say about these things. Yeah, Nunso. Well, I mean, you're the uh, China-Africa experts, so I should you your opinion. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree. I mean, there's enough space for the U.S. and China in Africa. Um, and both parties bring different things to the table. And, you know, it's good for everybody. I mean, we know that the world is very competitive, uh, but it doesn't have to be an either or kind of scenario. Uh, China plays a key role in Africa. The US plays a key role in Africa. Uh, many countries play key roles in Africa. 
uh, and so that's that's perfectly fine. Um, from a debt management perspective, uh, like Julie said, the question is not how much debt that there is. Debt in itself is not a bad thing. The question is how you can service that debt and make sure that it does not lead to financial crisis. And I think that's where many African countries struggle. Uh, to look at Nigeria, for example, we know the debt to GDP that everybody likes to quote is very low. Uh, but because general government revenues are even lower, uh, even the small debt is challenging to service. And that's really the, that's really the, the challenge. Uh, and that's not something that, that China should do for Africa. That's not something that the US should do for Africa. That's something that African countries should be looking to do for themselves. I think Nigeria should be, in some sense, a model for many African countries because we have a debt management office uh, that if they show that there's transparency or just around foreign debt, that it shows that the situation of debt is always known, uh, at least most of the time. Uh, and so there's, it's not a case of everything is all bad, uh, but in terms of the decisions around how much debt you take, how you generate revenue, to how you make sure that your debt is sustainable, that's where there's still lots of room for improvement. Uh, so yeah, I agree with Judy, you know, China and the US can both play role in Africa. It doesn't have to be one or the other. In fact, it's in Africa's interest to have both parties uh, as uh, partners. Uh, and so, you know, there's enough space for everybody here. Can I just yeah, okay. quickly add? Can I just quickly add? <laughs> I wanted to say that from where I sit, I shouldn't be shaking my head so vigorously for the two, well, well, China and, and 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 the US. What? Oh ahead, yeah. Julie. I just wanted to say that <laughs> Nigeria, the, the federal government of Nigeria, gets a lot of criticism, especially from Nigerians online, and this is good. Nigerians have a responsibility and have a right to expect more from their government. But I think on this debt question and the Nigerian government institution responsible for transparency around debt is um, sort of a, a standard on the continent. In fact, when there was this argument on, 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 on social media about how much debt Nigeria actually owed to China, they published how much of Nigeria's debt was, was, was owed to China. And I think most African countries can learn from them. The second country in that line would be um, a Zambia under the new administration. They have also published very detailed how much debt they have. And I hope that first that this will continue in Nigeria, but that other African countries can look at Nigeria and learn from Nigeria. And then the people, for those of us who critique the Nigerian government when it doesn't do what is right, I think in instances like this, where the Nigerian government actually does what is right, we should praise them. Yeah, I almost feel like shopping at this point, yeah. For well, Nigeria, yeah. So, which, which is which is you know break. And you know one thing that struck me, non. So, um, when you you said, um, you know the issue about um, organizing our debts, um, to put it in in, in the demand's way, is not something that the two countries should do for us, but Africans should do for themselves. You know, it takes me to really looking at the one thing that Africa wants to do for itself, uh, which is the I'm under the ages of uh, the AFCFTA. Uh, that has become a, a buzz kind of word right now. Um, or you know, people are talking about AFCFTA. Um, Wamkele is having several meetings with different stakeholder groups. Um, we 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 have a strong uh, side reality in the continent, which you know, over over the issue of trade. Cost of trade is about the highest in the world from what uh, we gathered, and 90% also of that has to do with transporting goods. Um, how how do you think, um, if you were um, Kelly, uh, and, and, and the team, uh, the different stakeholders, how how do we navigate this? And it's not something that's going to happen in in, in a short. Um, it's not it's not a short term thing because uh, you know infrastructure does not take a day to just um, you know come up just like that, right? So how do you think they should be looking at resolving this issue? Well, uh, thank you. I mean, I think you, you said it best, you know, the AFC FTA is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And it's a institution that have to be built over time. Uh, I think in the African context, there are still many challenges. Signing the agreement is a big step, uh, but there are still many challenges that need to be overcome. Uh, but I think building the systems uh, that allow common processes, uh, common um, procedures for trade is a key first step. Uh, 
once you have that, then you have something to build on. I think one of the challenges is that there are so many different custom procedures, so many different non-tariff barriers to trade in Africa that uh, act as real, at the real kind of cost of trade within, within Africa. Uh, so having those common systems in place, having those common procedures, I think that's the first step to ensuring that you know, the reality of the AFCFTA can come to pass. But there are also other big challenges is infrastructure. You know, you can have uh, an agreement, but if there's no rules to trade across, if there's no rules to carry goods back and forth, uh, then you're still going to have those costs. Uh, there's also issues around the complementarity between what African countries produce. Um, so there's, 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 a, there's a lot of challenges, uh, but I think, you know, focusing on the systems, uh, ensuring that that is built properly and that the agreements are there is a key first step that I think many African countries can, can rally around. Yes, and so, so thank, thanks a lot, Non. So, uh, Judy, I'm just looking at um, maybe rephrasing it a bit more. Um, how do you think um, that AFCFT would want to engage um, both US and China? I know that China has been proposing to build some road, you know, that can help, uh, you know, this issue around, you know, the uh, supply chain and, and, and all our transportation. How do you propose that this, this two they engage or collaborate with um, the US and China uh, to, to resolve the challenges around, you know, transportation um, and overall the cost of, um, you know, um, trading in the continent. I want to use a quick example that I, from Liberia when I was in government to, to stress the point that both you and Nanzo made about how long this process would take. When we came to office, we, we, we did very well on control of corruption, the Transparency International Index. And the reason we did very well, because initially when we came, we were just, we were passing laws on controlling corruption. We were passing laws on establishing an independent audit committee, uh, commission. We we're passing laws and passing laws is good, is an important point, but it's not the easiest. Once those laws were passed and the institutions were established, when they started to work, then our score began to go down, right? <laughs> Because now, now, now that you have the institutions and they're beginning to find corruption, the country's score started to decline. And so I think just signing the document and creating the institution, creating a legal entity is difficult, but it's almost the easiest part. The actual work now becomes, and, and the closest we have of something that we're trying to do would be the European Union. And even up to today, the European Union is still struggling to be able to resolve that. So it's gonna be a long thing. The, fact, this, the second thing I would say to your question then is that over 90% of freight and passenger movement across Africa is, is, on, is by roads. And so simply by improving road connections between countries, you can improve the, the value and, and quantity of, of trade between countries, right? Be, besides anything that the AFCTA does, if we can improve that. Now, the... the, the what actually impedes trade, and, and also mentioned this, were non tribe barriers. The harmonization, so for example, a, if something like a single border post, where if the goods come from, from Togo and crosses into Benin, if it is checked on the Togolese side, there's no check on the Beninois side, it just moves forward. If it is checked on the, Benin, uh, the Beninois side, it crosses into Togo. The, I, one of the examples I use is how the distance between Cape Town and Johannesburg is almost equal to the distance between Johannesburg and Lusaka, but it takes a truck driver 17 hours from Cape Town to Johannesburg and five days from Johannesburg to Lusaka. Part of that are these non-trade barriers. I think this is something that we can focus on and be able to do. This, the, the, so where I think the Chinese or the Americans and the AFCTA can focus is the African Development Bank began to do this a while back. It's a focus on regional infrastructure. So if we're building roads, those roads are connecting countries. They're not just, you know, it's, it's helping to make trade easy, make trade possible. So <clears throat> going back to the point of China and the U.S., I think one of the things that the U.S. can help or work with the AFCTA on is creating these systems that make it easy for border posts, especially for customs around borders, um, bringing tools like cameras, bringing tools that sometimes you don't have to open the container. The container simply passes through a machine and you're able to check what, what's happening. All of those things will help reduce the cost of trade 
uh, and, and that's somewhere the U.S. can help in terms of building the soft infrastructure, the systems. And what the Chinese can help with is what they've been doing for the last 20 years, the hard infrastructure, the roads, the ports that allow us to be able to do this. So great on signing the agreement, great on the negotiation of uh, rules of origin. All of that stuff is great. But I think there's still low-hanging fruit, non-trade barriers that we can remove and help to build integration on the continent. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And just as I was, I was just looking at the time, I'm like, oh, I didn't know this conversation would go. You know, I thought within one hour, we're probably going to be struggling uh, to end, you know, this. But we we have a couple of um, thoughts that have not been shared. And that's the issue around uh, the COP26 uh, and the, um, the energy transition and the African realities. Um, and then uh, the, the, the issue around the fossil fuel, um, you know, uh, development and funding hydrocarbons, and um, you know, knowing full well that I, I at 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 some of the, at the meetings, some um, African leaders happy to sign up, even though we know that uh, technically our lives depend almost on on this. Um, how how do we really see the way forward for um for for, for the continent uh, and Nigeria in particular? Um, how do we um do we honestly think that we're going to get funding from from the external to to be able to support you know us being able to, uh, to move to that um, to transit to these uh, more cleaner energies that we're 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 looking at? And uh, uh, any one of you can really start. Uh, well, I mean the the climate change challenge is a real one, and it's a global effort. I think nobody will be spared uh, and just from a forward looking perspective i'm hopeful that the world will meet the net zero challenge uh, but when the world meets the net zero challenge as african countries we don't want to be stuck at the end of the line right we want to be part and parcel of that future uh, so the question is really how do we transition to that and of course we know the history african countries are not responsible for the bulk of global emissions both historically and today and so we should not be, African countries should not be held uh, at, to the same standard as the other countries who are responsible for this uh, emissions challenge. Uh, and so there is definitely a need for support to adapt uh, to a new reality and to mitigate some of the consequences of climate change, in which African countries are some of the most affected, African countries are small island states. And so that, that agreement needs to be in place. Uh, I think Nigeria is doing a decent job in terms of having its own national interpretive contribution already set, having its own path towards that zero. And there's still a lot of debate around the transition and whether natural gas will be part and parcel of that uh, transition or not. Uh, but I think the important thing to realize is that, is that there needs to be equity and justice. The countries that are not responsible for global emissions should not be uh, left to transition on their own. And should not be held to pay uh, for that transition process. I think that's the real key issue that needs to be resolved. I, I would just add that I think right now I'm very proud of this, to be honest. Globally, I am one of the Africans who's out there calling Westerners and Northern uh, 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 people from the global North, calling them hypocrites, calling them immoral in their treating in the treatment of Africa and you know, you know, I'm not an unhinged or crazy person normally, but on this question, because it is an existential threat to us, I, I, I think it is warranted. We noted in our conversation today that close to 60%, but over 50% of the labor force on the continent is involved in some form of agriculture. It means that any change in the climate has significant impact on lives and livelihood across Africa. Today in Madagascar, we have the first climate induced famine that's happening. And that is what is projected to happen all across, say, northern Nigeria throughout the entire Sahel. But what the climate will end up doing is like following droughts, when the rains do come, it is projected to be so ferocious that it's going to lead to flooding. So, no continent, no region of the world is more at risk from climate change than us in Africa. Yet, as Nelson noted, we have contributed the least. In fact, if you remove South Africa and take only the 48 countries south of the Sahara, 
we have contributed less than 1% to historical emissions. And yet today, as we try to build our energy mix, Westerners are now passing policies to say no more investment in, in gas projects. Whereas at home, they are investing in huge gas projects. So what are we? It's almost as if Africa is being offered as an involuntary sacrifice so that we can make it to net zero. That's not gonna happen. We're never gonna accept that. And so the Nigerian vice president, perhaps to him, he's been one of the high profile African leaders who's spoken about what is truly a just transition to net zero. The Malawian president also has, has spoken out against this. Uh, uh, the, the Ugandan president has also spoken out against this. So I think, you know, there is a gathering consensus on the continent that there is not a single African country whose projections for, for energy is all fossil fuel. Most African countries, in fact, Ethiopia, Kenya, more than 50% of their power come from non-fossil fuels. Almost every African country imagines a future where they're using renewables. What we are arguing for is that there has to be some sort of transitional role for some fossil fuels like natural gas. And I think um, uh, it's not going to be easy because even right now, Mauritania and Senegal, they're struggling to raise money for their natural gas projects because of this Western moratorium on financing gas projects across the world. And I think African leaders need to find a way of how else we can be able to find alternative ways of, money, of, of resources to finance gas at least over the next three decades. I should say this, I should say this final thing, it's crazy. If you put all of the 48 countries south of the Sahara, remove South Africa because they use a lot of coal. If you put all of their energy together and triple it overnight using natural gas, it will still contribute less than 1% of global emissions. Hey, what? So I, I get excited too much. <laughs> I, but I, I think it's, it's really, really immoral what, what they're trying to do to us. It's almost as if they're making our continual poverty some sort of price that we have to pay on the path to net zero, and that's unacceptable. And I mean, yeah. I, just to add, I think, you know, um, it's also a key question is where you're coming from. Right? In many African countries, biomass and coal are still used, especially in rural areas, which is a lot dirtier than natural gas. Uh, and so as a transition, you know, natural gas may not be the worst flow. Uh, but a key risk is that you don't want to lock in investments in fossil fuels that end up um, limiting the potential for that kind of renewable, renewable energy. So the balance is key. Uh, but yeah, I agree with, you know, just like Judy said, you know, African countries should not be held up as a sacrifice for climate change, especially since African countries did not, are not the major, are not historically or even currently uh, the major emitters. Uh, everyone needs to, contribute their own fair and equitable quota towards tackling what is really a global challenge. Completely agree. Maybe this is another conversation around Africans talking to themselves about how to move forward. You know, it's something that um, maybe even AFCFTA, you know, what kinds of conversation would they be having with, um, you know, uh, people outside of the continent for Africa? You know, it's, I think these are uh, you know, very necessary conversations. But uh, again, like I said, we're, we're we're running very thin on time. But I'm really tempted to share this thought, and, and that that has to do with the uh, the new uh, the raw materials, the new uh, kids on the block that have um, gained the attention of a lot of people. I'm uh, I'm an avid watcher of certain kinds of films, uh, like um, the Black Panther, and I do recall that you know there was this you know. Um, mineral whatever that the kingdom had you know that was really needed by and it kind of it almost like a um a, a, a foretaste of what we were seeing now seeing a lot of uh countries in in the continent being the darling or prospective darling of uh these developed countries we've seen you know uh countries like congo you know seen uh, even you know uh, in nigeria you know um i was on the panel with the minister for Bustin and mining and he talked about the availability of lithium in, in the con in the country and a lot of other um um raw materials so uh, this again is 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 coming how how do how would africa play in this business because it's like you know 
we don't we don't want this to be business as usual we don't want it to start you know where um you know would it is near like um leverage africa the way you can as much as you can and then when it's not necessary again it kind of just kind of walk away we should be putting together some structure i mean this is me thinking around how do we process these um um, this it is uh, next um, generation or the now next generation uh, resources that we have in the continent to uh, greatest advantage. And so, sorry, I think I broke up for a second. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Um, maybe, maybe Jude can take this. If yeah, you know, let so me go first, then Nonso can hear from my answer and and, and be. Okay. I think. Okay. Look, we have been commodity exporters and remain commodity exporters. We are very fortunate that a significant number of the minerals that would drive the next economy, that would drive the net us to net zero, most of those economies, most of those minerals are in Africa. Uh, and, and the question is, what is going to be different this time? I mean, Nigeria has had oil for how long, <laughs> you know? Um, Zim Zambia has had copper for how long? The DRC has had copper for how long? We have been exporting minerals for a long time. We have ridden the boom and bust cycles of commodities. And, and, and today you go into most of our countries, you cannot believe that these countries have significant uh, uh, deposits. So yeah, I, I think we're, we're fortunate again that those minerals are in Africa, but do we have the systems in place so that at least this time around, the benefit us. The second thing is those minerals are not evenly distributed. The DRC has more of those minerals than other countries. Now, unless those minerals are processed in the DRC so that some of that value is added to the economy, it is possible all of that gets exported out of the country the same way and the value only accrues to say the DRC. So I think if, if COVID has shown us anything, it is that African prosperity would not happen as individual African countries, it will happen in the collective. So even as we look forward to the use, the new uses of these minerals, we have to ensure that we do not make the mistakes that we've made over the last, I don't know, 65 years or so. So I, I'm hopeful, but I'm also cautious that we don't just see the replay of everything we've seen with commodities in Africa, where the commodities become a curse and not a blessing. Awesome. Okay, um, I think I'll just piggyback to something Judy said, I think at the beginning of this uh, show, it's not about what you have, it's what you do. I think that's the key lesson that Africa needs to learn and is learning. Uh, it's okay to have minerals, and yes, you want to use them traditionally, but it's really about what you can do with those minerals, how you can use that to create value. Uh, and all that starts and ends with the investment that Africans make in their people, in the education, in the health of people in Africa. I think that is something that uh, if changes, then there is hope for a much, much brighter future, even with these minerals. Um, using minerals and thinking about the issue of mineral resources is a good thing, uh, if it's not sustainable, of course. Uh, but the real question is really, what do you do with the minerals? How do you create value from the, that opportunity that you've been given? Uh, and I think that's that's the real game changer for Africa. Thank, thank you so much, Nonso. So I, I'll quickly move to um, some, some area of politics, and that has to do with the democracy summit that um, the, the US hosted recently for 100 countries. Uh, and they, a lot of African leaders you know, were at that summit. And, uh, you know, there, were, there was a bit about defending human rights, uh, you know, things around respect and um, you know, fight against corruption and authoritarianism. Uh, some people say, and you know, I, I, I don't know if I agree, that the issues around authoritarianism kind of is, 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 is part of the African system. I don't know, you know how, how, how true that is. But again, um, if we look at you know the the democracy offered by the by the U.S. and overall by the West, and in some way um, when you see what um, maybe a country like China you know claims they have as 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 or say they have as 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 um, a, 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 as a democracy, the point is what part should we uh, in Africa? What part should we tread? Uh, 
are we are we wearing a garment that's not ours or is there something that we we really need to do right today so recently i was uh, on a panel when the africa barometer survey was unveiled and one of the, they surveyed Africans, ordinary Africans in 34 African countries, and two things came out. One was that, you know, when when asked which form of development, what kind of which of the two models, whether China or the United States, you know, a third of them, 33% said the US model and 22% said the Chinese model. The second thing was that a majority of Africans wanted more accountability from the government and they wanted a say in how those leaders are chosen. So they didn't say democracy, but what they described was closer to democracy than anything else. So it's like in, in Africa, that's what people want. They want governments that are more accountable and accountability means, I mean, one of the things that's, that, that sets uh, democracies apart is that every few years, people get an opportunity to change their leaders if they need to if the leaders are not performing. Now, it, it, the system may not work all of the time. So I think the U.S. calling this, this summit, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like the U.S. was calling this summit at a time when the U.S. democracy itself is facing crisis. I mean, we had a situation here where for the first time in, in any recent history, the outcome of an American election was questioned because the incumbent refused to accept the results. There was an assault on the US Congress on the day when the ceremonial was supposed to uh, uh, confirm the results of that election. So it's not as if the United States has been this paragon of democracy forever. In fact, the US is struggling with that democracy today, but it's not just the US, all across Europe, there's significant stress and strains on democracies. So I, I, I think, you know, if the US calls a democracy cry, a, a summit in humility, understanding that every country, every democratic country faces some kind of a struggle, that's fine. But I, I think the days have, are gone now where the U.S. can, can come and lecture people about what, how democracy is supposed to function. Some of the biggest stories in democracy in Africa did not happen with U.S. assistance. When the Kenyan Supreme Court suspended the update and, and canceled the, the, the outcomes of the elections because of in, uh, uh, um, irregularities, that didn't have anything to do with the U.S. When the Malawians, you know, elected uh, 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 the challenger over the protestation and, 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 and intimidation from the incumbent, that didn't happen with the U.S. So Africans are developing their own path toward democracy, and I think it ought to be acknowledged and, and shown respect. But, but it, it appears, at least from the survey we have, that Africans favor democracy as the form of government more than any other government. Form. Great. Also, yeah, I mean, I agree. The surveys uh, uh, are, uh, have the same story repeatedly that Africans support democracy, Africans want accountability, Africans want to see in how their government works. Uh, I think that's very clear. Um, the challenge is to improve the quality of democracy, and that again is a marathon, it's not an overnight. Um, thing or something that you build over time. Um, and you know, African democracy does not have to look like uh, that in the US. Uh, it doesn't have to look like that in Europe, uh, but it has to be something that works for Africans and that it tries the principle of everyone participating in government, uh, especially in the Nigerian context for women and young people. Uh, and so I think the support for democracy is strong uh, and there's opportunity to continue to improve that democracy. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Plus, the fact that we know that we we have traditional forms of democracy, even in 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 the continent, that we can look at and you know, um, and 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 fit in these models into you know current realities, and and really do that which is like you said, uh, uh, you know, re re realistic for for African countries, right? Um, so like I I keep looking at the time, but I, I mean I'm finding this very. Um, interesting and uh well i think we will need to come to an end at you know at this point but before we go i would like um you to share um what in, in a nutshell what you think 2022 holds for nigeria 
um, uh, but more spe specifically for Nigeria, but overall for Africa, you know, um, just freestyling in, in any way, any sector, uh, politics, economy at all. Um, Nonso, please, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, I think 2021 has been a year of recovery uh, from what was a very difficult 2020 for most African countries. And I think the theme for 2022 should be to build on that recovery, uh, to make sure that African countries recover better and move even beyond uh, the situation that they were before COVID. And I'm optimistic that for many countries that will be the case. So, I, Nigeria is our leader in Africa, at least for us in West Africa. I, I, Nigeria is either the anchor that drags us down or the rocket that lifts us. Where Nigeria goes, so we go. And last year, in, in 2021, there were, one, there were 12 deals, uh, private sector deals of 100 million plus. In 2020, there were only two. Now, Nigeria is the leading destination of, of investment in, in tech. So for 2022, I think Nigeria in Africa, I think Nigeria will continue to lead us. Nigeria will continue to lead us in, um, in the creative arts. Nigerian musicians will continue to top the charts. So Nigeria, Nigeria intellectual output, whether it's the firms they establish, the music they make, the movies they make, will continue to lead. I hope 2020 will be the beginning when Nigerian political leadership will begin to match the same quality that we're seeing from the private and non-private sector in Nigeria. So, you know, big ups to Niger leaders. We 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 were with Nigeria and we we rise with Nigeria and we hope Nigeria can lead us to that future that we want for Africa beginning in 2022. Yeah, th thank you so much. I mean, this is great. I I I I was happy you didn't say we'd rise with Nigeria or fall with Nigeria. So that is really um, a message of hope as we move into 2022, um, building what uh, from what we have uh, done in 2021, and leveraging you know what we're doing in in you know sectors that we're already um, seeing a lot of traction. You know, the, the creative industry, um, in the tech space, in the fintech. Uh, these are areas that we we. Um, we are very um, forward looking uh, as opportunities for um, for 2022, uh, but also um, keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that you know the the the, the politics uh, you know around around uh, us match the hope that we have in in this sector. So, thank you so much, Donso, and thank you so much, Jude. I I really would have loved for us to continue with this conversation, um, but again, you know we we have to do what we have to do also knowing for well that you have your time and we had asked you for one hour uh, so thank you for making our time to to join us today and to our listening audience and who've been um uh, you know been with us through the year um let's keep our fingers crossed and uh fingers crossed in hope that all that we have discussed today i would see them happen in 2022 and uh merry christmas and a happy new year uh, you know, in advance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.